Hey everyone, Christoph Trapp, your host. Funny story to get us started. I'm wondering why is that music still running? Because I got another window open. Because we are live today, LinkedIn, Amazon, Twitter, YouTube, and there is a webinar version as well over on the webinsights.com website if you want to check them out. Web Insights, of course, is presenting today's webinar, and they help you identify your website visitors quicker. And who wouldn't want to do anything quicker? Seriously, the pressure is on. You know, at the very least, it's not the end of the month or the end of the quarter today, so we can maybe breathe a little lighter, but, or easier, I suppose. But why always wait, right? Keep moving forward. Keep um pushing people down your funnel, so to speak. Now you got a visual. Today I'm joined by a number of experts, um, expert B2B funnel builders, so to speak. And we're gonna talk about how do you personalize the B2B buying funnel. And B2B especially is so interesting. It's getting more and more complicated as we know it with buying committees and, and you know different budget holders and, and other things. So we'll get to our guests here. I'll bring them on one by one ask them to introduce themselves really briefly, and then we'll have an interesting discussion. If you have any questions and you are watching on any of these channels, please feel free to leave them in the comments and we will uh, we will try to get to them. Uh, we already have a number of questions over on the webinar site, but we'll go from there. Today's first guest, and we'll, uh, we'll go down the line here as they're showing up on my screen, not alphabetical order, that's too much work for my brain today. Chris Ashley Mans of, I think it's um, Webio. Webio is that how you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. It's not, yeah. Thanks for joining us today. Tell us quickly about um, what you do and who you are. Yeah, sure. Um, nice to meet you all. Good afternoon or good morning. Um, I'm Chris Ashley Mans. I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Webio, which is an award-winning B2B website personalization platform. Our product enables clients to recognize every visitor to their website which ultimately helps boost that buyer journey increase those all important conversions and enables clients to realize serious revenue from their website and who wouldn't want that right so fantastic so let's move here to the next person sean pender log me in sean welcome to the show hey everybody and thanks for having me nice to meet you christoph um, my name's Sean Pender. I'm head of acquisition marketing for LogMeIn uh, in Europe. Um, our company is one of the top 10 SaaS B2B companies in the world, and we provide 16 different products that help companies remote work. Um, so it's very topical at the minute um, from all aspects of remote working, security, collaboration, um, support, and things like that. So that's us. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for joining us and um, really appreciate you making the time and sharing your insights today as well. Um, next up, we have Chris Wixon, Integrate. Chris, welcome. Thanks, Christoph. Great to be here. Another Chris. Um, so, yeah, I'm the general manager for Integrate here in EMEA. Uh, if you're not familiar with Integrate, we are um, the leaders in a relatively new kind of emerging category of what we call precision demand marketing. Um, our software is used by mainly mid-market enterprise B2B marketing teams, log me in, good example, um, to really connect and execute multi-channel strategy across um, things like content syndication, ABM, display, events, uh, webinars, social channels, and uh, looking forward to the discussion today. Awesome. That's And it should be an interesting discussion. I was just kind of rereading the first question. I'm thinking we can talk about this question for the next eight hours, but... I will keep you guys on track. So just a fair warning, um, the um, moderator here. Next up, um, last but not least, Lila Wade with Web Insights. Um, Lila, of course, has been on the podcast a number of times, the Business Storytelling Podcast. This is also publishing as that podcast version. So if you don't want to watch it on video today, you can watch it as an audio podcast tomorrow. Why not? Lila, welcome back. Hi, hi, nice to be back. Nice to see you again. Um, uh, so yes, I'm from Web Insights. I'm the Group Chief Marketing Officer. Um, and um, essentially, we um, identify uh, your organization. Um, so totally in the B2B space, um, but um, also a, a SaaS proposition, just like uh, the rest of the panelists today. So yeah, looking forward to a good discussion today. 
Awesome. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. So, I mean, let's dive in. I mean, this this should be an interesting um, chat with you guys. I'm always interested to hear what others have to say. But the B2B funnel today, the customer journey, and I got this picture in my mind. It's like a roller coaster ride. But I don't know. You guys tell me. What is the journey today? What what does it look like? I mean, is it a funnel? Is it a uh, yeah, you guys tell me what I need to learn. I mean, this is just, it's too difficult for a guy like me. Who wants to kick us off? Oh, Shall I go? Oh. Go on, Chris. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> You're very confusing. I mean, you talk about being a roller coaster, Christoph. I think um, at the moment, customer journey reminds me of Christmas tree lights, that tangled mess when you get them down from the attic. Some bulbs are missing or blown. Wires are twisted and tangled. That's how the, the, the vision that comes to mind um, for me when I think of a customer journey. Um, you know, they're not they're absolutely non-linear and haven't been for a long, long time. Um, people are going to enter a customer journey, leave and come back at many different points across many different channels. So um, you know, they're, they're super complex um, now than they were maybe a decade ago for sure. I like the uh, the Christmas tree analogy there. I was, I was going to say um, a bit of a bowl of spaghetti, um, but I completely agree with your point there, Chris. Yeah, we, we know there's more people involved in buying decisions than ever before. We know the number of touch points that each of those people requires to kind of move them through their journey is higher than it's ever been. And then just to make, I guess, our lives even harder as marketers, we know they're doing that on their own time in their own terms on the channels they choose you know, when they choose um and, and it's they're a long way through that decision making process before they actually want to engage with sales and start a conversation with us so it's a it's a complex complex time and um and i know that um linkedin recently did um some research um and um uh, one of the really interesting findings from that was that there are on average in B2B 4.6 different groups of uh, involved in a, in a buying decision now um, in an organization. So everything from procurement to the business function to finance to tech. Um, so 4.6 different groups. So that's not even individuals, that's groups of people. So I, I couldn't agree with Chris and Chris more that it's, it, it's so much more complex than it ever used to be. There's more people involved. And I think that there's many, many more um, channels for um, kind of influencing the buyer journey now. Um, you know, often, um, as uh, as Chris mentioned in the the kind of um, Christmas light analogy, people will um, come into your buying um, process. They'll come out of it again. They'll come back in at another point. They might use, leverage another channel. They might get some peer influence. You know, that sort of thing. And so. It's, it's definitely more complicated and it's definitely not a, a linear approach, but I was really surprised to hear that there's 4.6 groups on average involved in every business um, or B2B buying decision process. I feel that was quite a, you know, a, a significant number. Yeah, and I think from my point of view in that, like, like that's something that we did experience pre-COVID. We had like five, six different departments you had to speak to in the customer journey, but then COVID hit and with our products, it became one person and our customer journey completely changed because people had to get software in quickly. So we spent 2020 with a completely different customer map and journey that we worked on. And now we have to change it all again for 2021. So it's been very strange over the last couple of years for us in terms of our customer journey and planning for it. So at 4.6, I mean, it's just crazy. And this, this is why companies are talking about that you have to collaborate at a different level, right? Because if you have um, 4.6 departments you have to deal with, and they're all jerks, you know, not not us, not my department, but everybody else's. Do you know what I mean, though, right? I mean, if you can't get along, I mean, nothing ever will get bought ever, you know, right? Because you can't even talk to each other. But how do you even start? How do you know you have the right journey? And how do you, you know, I mean, how do you like, should you document it? Or what's your guys's philosophy on that? Yeah, I think that the documenting it is 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 crucial, but um, it's because of the the fact that it's more like a Christmas tree light situation. It's it's actually really hard to get it down on on paper or on on screen. But um, you know, a typical place to to start creating that journey map 
um, is about documenting what you think those ideal stages are. So, you know, from at first point of where a potential customer or prospect is, is going to come across you, what are those different stages that you have that a customer has to go through that stage? And, and using that really as a real starting point um, and then identifying and marrying that back to um, you know, what might a, a prospect um, or a lead or a customer, what might they be thinking, feeling or doing at each of those individual stages? That's how I tend to approach a customer journey um, You know, at the, at the very first point is you'll buy actual buying stages and processes that customers have to go through, but then marrying it back to what those audiences are thinking, feeling and doing. We um, one exercise that we've done internally here um, for our own benefit, but also you know, recommended this to many of the companies we work with is to do what we would call deal DNA. So literally take the handful of most recent um, ICP, ideal customer profile deals that your sales team have closed and manually. And it, it can be quite a fun exercise. It's the sort of thing would be great to do in more normal times around a whiteboard, but literally go back and dissect that deal. You know, all the way from the day they signed the paperwork back to the very first point you saw them appear in your marketing automation system. You met them at an event. They downloaded some content and really start to piece together, like map out that journey. Who were the people involved? What did they do? Where, where were you? on that journey and what, what content did they engage with? How did they interact with you? And if you do that a few times, it can, like I say, quite a manual process and can take time. But if you do that, you know, with four or five deals, you can actually start to build up a really interesting picture and start to see are there some patterns? Can we actually overlay what actually happened back to what we think should be happening? Um, so that's something I say we, we've used very effectively ourselves internally. Um, and I think seeing other companies use um, to good effect. And I think, Chris, that's a really good point is that, um, you know, all um, buyers will go through an early stage, a middle stage and a late stage in that buying journey. Um, and to try and understand the trends associated with that is, is absolutely crucial. Um, but I think to Sean's point as well is that we're... We, we need to be agile in that and so maybe it's something that needs assessing on a regular base to see, basis to see how um, that buying journey um, evolves over time and because there are external factors um, that do influence that and of course you know the pandemic that we have have all been through and are hopefully coming out the other side of now we're not quite there but um, you know hopefully um, we are we, we've definitely seen some changes and it's had to we've had to have marketing and sales teams keeping you know keeping on their toes and it's it's completely thrown the old ways of doing business up in the air so i think it's really important to maybe undertake that that process um chris periodically um to make sure that you actually have um uh, a firm understanding of the evolving buyer journey over time and how that can change and how external um, factors can influence. And I think Sean's is a, is a really great example of that as we move to kind of like a remote working environment, how that affected Log Me In was, it, can I, can, it must have been profound, Sean. Yeah, it was, it got to the point where like, I think we couldn't even, we weren't even marketing anymore. It was just such a thing that like, companies needed our software that they were just calling in and we, you know, people were jumping on and supporting the sales and the inbound calls team that wasn't even, it just became so much. So like that was great in one sense, but like that was a great year for Log Me In, but now we have to see how we build on that and adapt. And, you know, it's building that customer journey out and how could we cross an upsell to customers that we did bring on board. And then is there any customers who maybe panic bought different software and now we can alleviate those pain points and building that new customer map to support that. But and going back to Chris's point, that's something that we do quite a lot is that ideal customer journey. And we have a real-time feedback loop to our data science team who actually can give us that information quarterly and even monthly if we ask it, is there any kind of new changes or how many touch points is it taken for a deal? How many days is something sitting in pop pipeline and things like that? So we, we've got quite efficient in that over the last year, but um, you know, there's still lots of work to be done with things changing. I, also think I, I love Sorry, I was, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, in terms of yeah, customer journeys need to be very much data, data led. But there's also the human aspect as well. You know, we are people, buyers are people, our audiences are people. So you do have to play that, um, play that emotional part, the emotional game back as well. In terms of what are those individual personas or buyers, you know, what are their pains and their challenges and their issues right now? Going to Lila's point, 
which will change constantly. So you always have to have that that um, that awareness as well. So persona based insight and customer insight is, is, is incredibly valuable and needs to be looked at on an ongoing basis for sure. What I love about that comment. So first of all, real 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 time data. And then thank you for the reminder that that people we are all indeed people, right? All I mean, let me look, let me verify. But everybody here looks like we're humans. But I think you know, I grew up in Germany, and as you might be aware, Germans are very black and white. I mean, we we really are, right? So, <clears throat> but there's gray areas. You can't just be all data or all gut feeling or all whatever. So you kind of have to marry all the different things together. Um, so, so you guys kind of jumped into this a little bit, but but how do I even keep up? How do I make sure things are current? And I, uh, when you guys were talking about that, and uh, Dave Carruthers, v, uh, CEO at Vox Pop Me, his quote came to my mind, and he said, "Is it a knee jerk reaction to something happening right now, and it's going to change back, or is it going to change long term?" And I'm telling you, in my opinion. This whole COVID mess. I mean, there's there's a lot of changes that I thought were knee jerk, but they seem to be long term or longer term. Who knows what long term means anymore? But how do you know? How do you like? In addition to the two things you guys already mentioned, how else do we make sure we're up to date and and what's the good uh, good cadence? I mean, Sean, you mentioned quarterly. Um, I mean, what's 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 the right time to do those things? That's a it's a great question. And we we work quarterly in our business. That's why we kind of do that. But I like we can get up to date information all the time. And it's something I think one of the key things we do is look at our product usage and then look at the feedback from sales and all the customer facing teams and um, to get that feedback and kind of talk to our customers about those pain points. But I think one thing we are missing is for marketing is getting out there face to face. Um, and those real real face-to-face -face events, again, we're all looking forward to them to come back. Because you get into a more personal conversation. You could be going for a drink at the bar with them or something like that. And they might open up a little bit more rather than having these face-to-face -face video calls and things like that. So it's, it's trying to bring in all those information. Then it's how do you bring them all into one place so it's not different teams saying different things. And it's amalgamating them all together, I think, is the challenging part for us at the minute. Yeah, Christoph, I think picking up on something you said around, I don't think buyers are going to, as people, are going to go back to the way we necessarily did things pre-COVID. I do think things have changed from a B2B buying perspective. They are in the driving seat. Like we often say, integrate. It is now, a, if it wasn't before COVID, it definitely is now a buyer's world. You know, uh, come back to what I said earlier. They are in the driving seat. They want to engage and see the content in their own time on the channel of their choice. So I think the challenge now becomes to us as marketers is, how do we how we make sure we're there to meet them you know rather than what's our own internal marketing funnel that we want to move them through you know actually flip to a buyer model you know what are the buyers trying to what are the jobs and the journey they need to go through and how can we make sure that we're effectively there to meet them across channels because uh, as Lida said as the buying groups get bigger people are going to want to consume content in different channels some people are going to want to go back to it in person events as soon as they're back other people might love the fact they never have to go to a trade show again and can do everything passively on, you know, in front of their screen. Um, other people want to read content, other people want to listen to podcasts. So it's more complex, but we, you know, I think the more and more we put the buyers, um, you know, we have that sort of buyer mindset as, as how we think about our own strategies, the more, more effective we'll, we'll be. And I think that, um, yeah, I definitely think there'll be these things that will happen such as um, the global pandemic that will just be a total gear change for everything. And I think it took most of us totally off guard. Um, and we probably did have to be reactive and kind of like, what the, what the hell are we going to do? Um, and, um, you know, there will be those things that will come up from time to time. Hopefully they're very rare. And actually the... Um, the evolution of buyer journeys will um, will just be a case of you know keeping on top of that evolution rather than these absolute 
fundamental gear change which all gear changes which obviously the pandemic has has caused and i think that the that the pandemic will have caused many changes in business um you know some for the better um and, and some for the worse and um you know obviously we all know that the event industry um you know is really struggling right now hopefully that will recover um i'm on the same page with sean as i can't wait to get back to you know expos and all of that sort of thing um you know sort of speaking to people face to face as far as I'm concerned, there's, there's nothing better. Um, but I do think there's a consideration in terms of the makeup of the workplace because um, by, what I got here, so by 2025, 75% um, of the workforce will be made up of Generation Z and Millennials who are generally much more open to um, digital um, kind of buying influences, looking at various different channels, peer-to-peer -peer referencing is huge in those kind of um, sectors. And so I think that um, we're, as marketeers, we're going to have to keep um, a, um, a steady and constant eye on how those buyer journeys are changing and what other factors come into the, the journey, um, you know, social various social media peer to peer referencing i think it's something like um 54 of all b2b buying decisions have some point of um social media research um within that within that buying de uh, decision making process and so i think that's only going to become more prevalent but i think it's definitely something that needs to be monitored over time but also you can't be doing that every week um you know i'm on exactly the same page as sean um quarterly works for us um that seems to keep our finger on the pulse um but not to the point where we drown in data you, you know so much information but the one that really hit me hard is the comment about social media because i got so many b2b companies say to me oh my goodness Oh, we don't get any direct leads on social media. Maybe not direct leads, but guess what? People look at the stuff. People see what you're saying. And if you don't say anything, then guess what? They don't see anything. So it is very important. I don't know if that's what you were referring to, but that's what came to my mind when you said that, um, when you made yeah. that comment. Yeah. Like you say, in B2B, m monetizing the direct return from social media is really hard. Um, but it's certainly, um, you know, a huge influencing factor on uh, uh, on uh, the buying kind of customer journey, as well as um, review sites um, and influencers, um, you know, all of those things that maybe haven't been in the decision making um, mix previously um, are, are really, um, you know, part of that. And it's and it's so diverse now. It's so disparate. So you're absolutely right. If you're not on social, then if 54% of B2B decisions are influenced at some point by social media, um, it, it's kind of a no brainer that you have to be there, even if you can't directly attribute lead generation from social media you have to think that it's going to contribute to that uh, kind of buying decision um, at some point in the process so you're absolutely right i think the um the lines have definitely blurred over recent years between b2b and b2c you know like i think chris said earlier we are selling to people consumers and that you know, I just think there's an ever increasing expectation in the B2B world for consumer like experiences and consumer like um, journeys. And we know social and, as you say, peer to peer sites are just an important part in that uh, purchase decision as they are for us at home when we're making our own kind of consumer decisions, too. Yeah, very, very true. Interesting discussion. And uh, the whole human to human thing, I think that's going to become more and more. I don't know why we why we all went down that rabbit hole too far, quite frankly, thinking that B2B, it's not humans. I don't know if anybody ever said that, but that's kind of what it felt like, right? Because B2B is so different. Oh, it's so different. Um, so I'm a big football fan, American football, so soccer too, to a lesser extent. But I know what they do to me all the time. I need no more hats. But I get retargeting ads nonstop. Here's a new T-shirt. Here's a new whatever. And you know what I'm saying? Like constant, constantly in front of me. And I buy them. Too many. Ask the Amazon driver. But in B2B, 
I don't necessarily see that push quite as often. So if I'm going to a website, I'm checking out, let's say a new software tool or something, sometimes I do see it, but maybe not quite as pushy, you know, like the remarketing and retargeting. So of course, um, we're talking about Web Insights, webinsights.com, you can identify your visitors quicker. The most important thing is probably you got to figure out who you're talking to, right? But once you know your, your, your customers, your prospects, how do you nurture them? How do you move them down the down the funnel? What are your your tips and tricks that you can share? Um, I think for me, it's the social proof thing, and, and Lila touched on this. Um, it's really much around you know people want to have um, sort of peer to peer recommendations. So being able to serve customers with um, in, in certain relevant segments, um, case these and experience and dem you demonstrating how you've managed to change that person's world i think that is that that whole social proof thing has become more and more important now when you compare as consumers how we buy to how we buy as as, as business people you've got so much more at stake as a b2b buyer you know if you if you choose the wrong software um for your business and and, and buy you know your, your, your job's at stake so um it's very different to if you make the wrong decision on what kettle or toaster you buy at home there's much more at stake. So um, social proof and peer-to-peer -peer, um, is, is become much, much more important for us, that for sure. And so leveraging that in our, our comms as much as we can is helping to support, um, move that movement of people further down that, that, that buying journey. And I think for us as well with that, <clears throat> Because as Lila said earlier, if there's four or five different kind of parts of the buying committee, you have to be able to talk to each of those pain points for those people. So they all kind of go on their own little journey within that prospect. The buying committee there might go on their own little journey. And it's giving those case studies, like Chris says, that gives them examples of the pain points they've, re they've kind of relieved. But I think one thing for us that's a big issue at the minute is actually our biggest competitor's decision not to buy rather than a company going to a competitor. So it's again, building those pain points, how we're actually the benefits of our solution and showing good examples of companies that are similar to the, theirs. So that's what we try to build up case studies in all the different verticals, different company size to cover all those firmer graphics and kind of show how we can do that. We've, um, we've done a useful exercise here that I think we're sharing. Um, you know, when we think about the different stages, we're trying to move the accounts and the buyer through. We've put together a bit of a framework of, of different questions that the buyer's trying to answer at each of those stages. So right, you know, further up the funnel, just in that awareness stage, we're not necessarily trying to shout about our products at this point or tell them how great we are. We're more in that, okay, why should they change? You know, what are those pain points? And, and, and that very much drives our content and the channels we might use. And as they become familiar with, okay, they start to realize they have got a pain, there's, there's some reason to change, then we're into, okay, so why should there be some urgency? Why why should they should be changing now? And what sort of content should we be trying to serve to help them move through that bit? And then once they hopefully realize they've got a problem and they want to do something about it, then we're into, okay, now how do we really showcase to the points just made, like why we are a great vendor, why other similar companies have, have used our products to solve their problems, so I, I think there's that, like I said, that's been a, a really useful exercise for us to do internally to kind of just think about those questions, each of those journeys and try and match the content, the channels we would use to, to, to go and help them go and answer those questions. And I think just following up from um, Chris's point there, because that's quite similar to what we do is we, we map according to early, middle and late stage of the buying process. So. Um, uh, and, and as part of that, we've actually mapped our whole marketing strategy to those and we operate a pillar based marketing strategy. Um, it's actually a, a kind of concept taken from content marketing strategy, which is um, a PCB strategy, a pillar, cornerstone and brick strategy. So we have three pillars that are ma uh, mapped to each of those buying stages. So early stage is all about awareness. It's not about product, as, um, as Chris has just mentioned getting be, being in the right place where your buyers are knowing who your buyers are and creating 
thought leadership, educational content that is going to be digestible and interesting um, to um, that audience. To get your name just recognized or your brand name recognized, even before um, you know those buyers know that they even have a need for your product. So kind of that's our, our, our awareness pillar. We then have middle stage um, and within that pillar for us, it's all about advocacy. So testimonials, peer to peer recommendation, user generated content, influencers. So when your kind of buyers kind of know that they've got a need and they're starting to kind of think about the sort of solution they need, you've got lots of people literally with a megaphone um, singing your praises. Um, and then we have late stage. And that's all about how do you gain um, the influence across all of those stakeholders, as Sean mentioned. So how can you make sure that you're being perceived really well, not just by your immediate decision maker, but also by the finance department or the procurement department or the tech department or the market, whoever it is that's involved in that decision. How can you make sure you've got influence? How can you make sure that you're addressing their pain points? And we address that with an ABM strategy. So we have uh, kind of the three A's, um, awareness, advocacy, and then ABM as our pillar strategy. And everything that we do associated with marketing has to link back to one of those pillars to appeal to one of those buying stages. And of course, having pillars also helps you have that discussion. Why are we doing this? Doesn't fit into one of our pillars, right? We need to figure out how to make that work. Well, I, I think you guys have been great choices to be on the show because all I heard is uh, you, you got to have great content. So I'm, I'm I'm not disagreeing with any of you. Good, I mean, really appreciate that. Um, but my question is, yes, we need good content. Um, and also... Um, we need, you know, useful content. I don't remember who said it. Um, I, one of the Chris's, I think, Chris Wixon, maybe. Um, you can't just pat yourself on the back nonstop, right? Uh, state of the art, whatever, blah, blah, blah. A lot of companies do that. But how do you personalize the experience? So the, the thing that came to my mind, when you guys mentioned um, white papers, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yes, I get it. But I don't want a long white paper because most white papers that I look at, they're horrible. I mean, they are. They're like two columns or some. I've seen one with three the other day. I'm like, I can't look at it on my phone. You know what I mean? I'm sitting on the couch. Yes, B2B decision makers sit on their couch too. So how do I personalize? How do we personalize that that journey for people who like shorter content or they like video or they like whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like there's different um, uh, preferences. How, how, how do you go about that? And, um, we, did, uh, we did some research in the last quarter last year around how personalization is used within B2B. And um, we surveyed a, 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 just under a thousand B2B marketers and 75% of those are personalizing their activity in some form but one thing that leapt out for us in that survey is that um it's primarily outbound driven so 60 percent of people are personalizing on their outbound activity only and the reason they're able to do that is because of the data that they know so if you know that um you know it, it, that it may be based around personalization on um a persona type or a job type function or an industry type um, level of personalization but equally what coming back to your point Christophe around types of content um, you know you have to have that insight around okay what does that individual um, you know, type of content do they um, do they interact with um, so I think personalization is, is definitely being used but it's not easy to do and in, in, in most cases it's, it's outbound and, and, and data driven but there are other ways in which you can which you can personalize across other channels too. I think I think personalization of your marketing communications is hard. It really is. It takes mm -hmm. a lot of effort. Um, and oftentimes in the short term, for not a lot of return. It takes a while for these things to get started. It's a bit like a, a bit like a flywheel. Um, and I think if an organization is really looking to personalize that B2B buyer journey, I'm, I'm coming back to what a point that Chris Wixon you made is that um understand your icp like focus there who are your your ideal customer profiles and try and start with one and then figure out how to personalize 
that whole journey to get the greatest return. And because the likelihood is if you really focus on your ICP, they're going to give you the greatest re return. They're going to justify your um, investment in terms of time and, and, and money spent on personalization, but really make that personalization journey sing from end to end. So that's not just sending an email with a first name and a business name personalized. That's everything, putting best foot forward, making sure that you're the, the perfect ideal choice according to their pain points to really create that wow factor. Um, and actually to start off with, the smaller you can make that ICP, the better. So even if you're just looking at 50 potential like logos, if you like, that, that you wanna win, personalize for them, get the foundations and the basics right and then look to scale maybe to another icp and then another icp but if you if you kind of try to do it at scale first without having the um, foundations right in the first place it won't work none of it will work so you've got to get the solid foundation in place and then seek to scale from there and it's definitely encouraging um, to admit that it's hard. Thank you for saying that. I know. I I think sometimes we're in these meetings and we're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do this. And yes, we should totally brainstorm and work together. But it is hard, especially when things change all the time. Um, we do have. Let me take a look here. About a half a dozen questions from the audience. Let me just check very quickly if we have any additional ones here. Um, maybe let's dive into those if if we can. Uh, and I know they're just coming in live, so so you haven't seen those um, yet. Um, one of the questions we have is at what point, I find this one very interesting, at what point do you think a website visitor is ready for a lead and for a salesperson to approach? I mean, that, that's an interesting question. Um, when is the, I mean, if I'm filling out the form and saying I want a demo, you better call me or email me or set up a meeting, right? But I mean, that's a pretty clear answer. So I took the easy answer for myself. Sorry. <laughs> but what else? Well, I think that's a, I'll, I'll probably start off with that one if that's okay, considering that's that's quite in my wheelhouse. Um, but um, uh, so only 2% of people who visit your website will ever fill out a form. Um, so that's the first thing. So all of that traffic that's visiting your website there's got to be value in that, right? There's got to be value in those another, the other 98% of those visitors, but they will have a different profile. Um, and the way we classify them is revenue generating visitors and non-revenue generating visitors. So like um, a job seeker is unlikely to generate you any direct revenue, um, a competitor who might visit your website, they're not going to obviously be of any value. But there's a number of different um, personas um, who will visit your website and who will be of value. And that could be anything from an existing customer, a lapsed customer. It could be a, um, a, a, a someone in your sales pipeline, um, you know, that you're trying to, I don't know, speak to those 4.6 different decision making groups and they're visiting the website, all of those different stakeholders. It could be someone responding to your marketing campaigns or it could be someone completely new. So the most important thing in terms of identifying the next best action is to understand who the visitor is. Um, and then I think that you determine those ne next best actions based upon the visitor profile and whether they're revenue generating and, and, and kind of who they are. So if, for example, they're already in negotiation in terms of your sales pipeline, well, that makes sense for a salesperson to follow that up quite quickly, right? Even if the person doesn't fill out a form, that's totally right for the salesperson to put in a call and just see if they can help. Um, and that will infinitely help with close rates um, and just general sales pipeline close rates. Um, you might have new business visitors who have only visited once. Um, they're very at the early stage, maybe discovery stage. They might not be right to put in a call straight away. You might want to nurture them with a, a, a kind of a, a marketing automation um, kind of uh, you know, communications cadence or something like that. But if they visited your website 10 times in the last couple of months, then obviously from a lead score um, scoring perspective, 
then they kind of bump up the list in terms of, well, maybe it's about the right time to put in a call to that person. So I think that there's not necessarily a single answer to when is the right time to call a website visitor. I think it's actually a case of understanding the profile of those visitors and then mapping the next best action according to who they are and what their behaviour is and kind of putting them in the buckets associated with that to drive maximum value for the business. You know, what's so frustrating about that is um, there's no single answer. And I know we always want to simplify things and make them easier, but it's very true. And I'm even thinking about, you know, you have somebody coming to your website and and you know, like you're already talking to them, right? And you see what they're looking at. So you can use that as a as an advantage when you talk to them next, you know, and say, uh, say something relevant. I mean, in 10 years ago, people would have said that to me on a call. You know, they said, oh, I just read this. And you can respond, but even if they don't say that, you could do that. Um, what what other tips do you, uh, the rest of the panel, the expert panel, have on on the topic? I'm happy to go. <clears throat> um, so we, I would uh, completely agree with everything Lila just said. Uh, I would add on to that um, the use of intent data as well. So we partner mm -hmm. with Bombora in the Integrate platform. There's other intent providers out there. You know, and I think because if once you've got that blend of intent data and engagement data, so we, we're starting the intent data showing us that the account is potentially in market. A uh, Bombora's data, um, they you know, believe that on average only fifteen percent of accounts are actually in market at any one time for what you do or sell. So already the pool of account, you know, you might have your list of ICP accounts, hundred on there but potentially only 15 of them are actually in market at that time. So can you use intent data to identify who those 15 are that are showing those signals? They're researching, they're looking out on publication websites, downloading content. And then if you can layer on engagement data, i.e. they're on your website, they are engaging with you, they know who you are, that you're starting to see that activity. Once you've got that blend and you can start to then identify those individuals in those buying committees, then you're in a, a kind of sweet spot of right now feels like a good time. We're seeing all the right signals. Now is a good time to actually engage and, and get the SDRs or sales team to, to start following up with those um, with that information. Yeah, what we do the kind of oh, sorry, Chris, <laughs> to kind of match that is we have like an attribution model built around that whole intent and then engagement in our website. So based on all those things, they'll go into our CRM system and eventually they'll bubble up based on scoring and what they've done and that'll kind of bring them on the customer journey we want to bring bring them on. So thankfully we've a, I'll go back to our data science team who can figure all that stuff out for us and help us build that. But uh, it's really, really helpful when it comes to building our journeys and answering those questions. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that point around if you're using intent data and you are establishing, identifying that those people are actually on your site, which might stimulate a, a particular cadence or a, or a sales call, actually um we have using the ability here to actually personalize the content that those people are seeing on that site as well so not only do you know who that business is and take necessary action you're able to drive what that person sees and reads um on your website as well which which almost doubles the doubles the power there at the same time We said that someone was going to be speaking on you. Uh, and, um, yeah. Christoph, you're saying it's right. just me here, right? Oh, my goodness. At least you didn't let me go on for five minutes. <laughs> so, um, content, uh, content personalization, I mean, that's one of those topics, right? Where, I mean, when it works, it's beautiful, but it's not that, not that, um, not that easy, you know? So when it doesn't work, it can be quite the mess, quite frankly. But very interesting topic. Now, the one question the audience asked here, I think that fits here. Uh, they said, how can you produce a best in class customer journey when you don't? And I thought what they were going to say is don't have the right content, which is a, we can talk about that too. But they actually ask if you don't have the right data. And so I was slightly surprised by that question, because usually I don't hear companies say, we don't have enough data. Usually people just say, we don't know how to look at it or something like that. I mean, what's what's your guys' thoughts on that topic? 
Well, data is obviously, um, I'm a bit of a data geek, so data is super important to me. And I'd like to think that that data that we in my team use is, is, is pretty accurate, but the, 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 the importance of good quality data is absolutely right. And you need to leverage um, not only your own data, and in, in some cases, if it's not quite right, there are, are tools out there that can help support that so if you're trying to personalize content you can leverage other third parties data to supplement your own um so things like uh, potentially things like ip data um and other third party sources even um, tools such as bombora for example they can help not only identify and uh, establish businesses which are um are showing signs of intent that's backed up by information about what sector is that business in what's the makeup of that that the firmographics of that type of business so by using lots of different elements in, in, in your marketing technology stack, you can stitch up along these different data points that can help enrich enrich your data. Um, and you know, that's something that we use very well um, in cases where maybe our data isn't 100% tip-top tape. I feel like I'm gonna be the stat person in this webinar, but um, I'm gonna throw it out there is that, um, that it, it's actually probably a bigger problem than most B2B marketers realize. Um, so um, typically 25% of B2B marketers databases have inaccurate data. And um, in, a, in a recent survey of, um, of CMOs, 60% of them cited, um, uh, you know, inaccurate, troublesome data as a, as a big barrier for them. So actually it's probably the hidden kind of thorn in the side of, of a lot of b2b marketers that that actually 25 percent of their database is inaccurate um and if you're lucky to have lucky enough to have data scientists like like um like sean has then um of course that can be helpful in making sure that you've got accurate data but it's absolutely the foundation but without data you've got nothing. Um, and so it's worth investing in good quality, up-to-date data. It's worth making sure that at the very foundation, everything that you're building upon um, is being built on that solid foundation. And, and data is absolutely at the foundation of that. So it's often a hidden problem, but it is such a big problem if you have inaccurate data. Um, and the, the I guess the answer to that is, start working on not having inaccurate data because everything else will be flawed all of the time that your database is flawed and even if that means just getting the data right for your icps because actually your whole database is too much of a challenge to take well get it right for your siphoned off group of ic or one icp to start off with and then two icps get it right for that small proportion and then everything will be built on that solid foundation I think this is why we've seen um, marketing operations just rise in power and the profile of, of marketing operations. And I, I still think in Europe, we have quite a long way to go to catch up with our American colleagues and counterparts in terms of the maturity of marketing operations. I think a lot of companies now, certainly at scale, if you haven't got a rock solid marketing ops team in the house who are putting those foundations in place and maintaining them, then you really, you know, it's incredibly hard to scale and do a lot of this activity at scale. So I think marketing ops has become so important. Um, a quick anecdote, our um, director of marketing ops, Danny McKeever, joined us around a year ago. And the first thing he had his team do was basically a massive clean of our database, like pr literally manually agreeing with sales on what were the key fields, the key information we needed on an account level and the key personas we needed on those accounts got everybody aligned on what that information was and then went through basically it's just this exercise of cleaning out the database he, he kind of said he, he often says getting to an 85 percent marketable database and then keeping it there so making sure you've got compliant data we've got the right fields in there that we need to chris's point plugging in enrichment tools if we need to to make sure we've got up-to-date information in there bringing in the right profiles and then on a quarterly cadence he take, his team take 20% of that database and they'll do that cleansing exercise again just to keep that um, you know, good, good fuel in the tank. And I think you know, it's a byproduct of all the MarTech tools and technologies we've seen explode over the last decade that we've layered on and layered on more and more tech and tools in our different channels. But the, the downside of that has been just these messy, clogged up sewer pipes going straight into our CRMs that kind of 
cause a lot of these problems. So yeah, completely agree. Yeah, that's a real sort of fundamental starting point. I, I, you know, I, I, I think people underestimate how much time everything is. And I'm, I'm just thinking about uh, when I was at B2B publishing, you know, entire audience departments, that's all they did, right? They turned over the data and they basically just made sure it was updated. And when, when it hit a certain threshold, they kicked people out of the, the, the audience or the, the active audience at least. So um, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of, a lot of time. Um, and yeah, Sean, Sean has data scientists, I, I don't. But, um, you know, it's, it's something we always have to think about, of course. What's the time investment? Um, another question here from the audience is, um, where do we stand, especially GDPR-wise, as in calling anyone that has viewed our website? So what, what do we need to think about there as we reach out or use that data um, to personalize the experience? So I think that's probably, um, I'll, I'll kick that one off, that's quite relevant um, to me again, is that, um, so you, you can't actually identify um, an individual. Um, and um, so you're never going to be able to get to a point um, where unless you've got pre-information on that person, um, so say, for example, they're in your marketing database and they visited your website and you happen to have their contact information. Well, of course, you know, they've, they've at some point have, will have opted in to be in your marketing database anyway. So, of course, you're fine there. But I guess this question really relates to someone who's not in your database previously. Like, can you call them? Um, and the answer to that is that under GDPR, obviously, that is there with the intention of protecting personally identifiable information um, to protect the kind of interest of the data subject. Um, in the B2B space, um, uh, kind of um, uh, static um, IP addresses um, are associated with, with businesses and uh, contact information associated with those businesses um, are um, not covered under, under GDPR because they're not associated with an individual. And so um, you have to kind of look at um, the person who's visiting. So, have you already got consent for them? Um, with, you know, with them, have have they already have you already spoken to them at some point? Are they already in your CRM system? Have you already got contact information for them? If the answer is yes. Then, of course, you can follow up with um, you know some communications again. I'm sure they'll be more than open to that. If it's a cold opportunity. Um, and um, you know you're identifying a business has visited your website. Um, then, um, as long as you're um, you know processing um, business information, and actually you can process personal data on the basis of legitimate interest, um, but largely you won't ever put in a call to someone's mobile phone off the back of their website visit or something like that. It would normally be to a business telephone number. Um, an email address is personally identifiable information, so it is covered under GDPR. So you have to be mindful that um, you'd have to work on the basis of legitimate interest for that. Um, and you always have to give people the opportunity to be able to opt out um, and to say, look, do you know what? I don't want to hear from you anymore. As long as you follow those rules, you're perfectly fine. It's also an interesting question because if I am deep in into researching something and you might me at the right time maybe i appreciate it i mean i see plenty of those examples where i'm thinking really is this email really the best strategy but then i see the response and they say yes thank you for emailing i've been researching this whatever you know so it's always interesting to try and test um i know we're going to run out of time quickly here so maybe very briefly for the last question um, how about when you lose customers or prospects, I guess, rather, or, or maybe both? How do, you, how do you figure that out and how do you optimize for that experience um, to, to, to get people back in the funnel or whatever we want to call it? I think certainly there's a, a obviously you have to identify potential reasons why, um, why you've lost that customer. So from a customer care perspective, um, and when we talk about lo either losing a customer in the journey or losing a customer from, from a sale, it's all about you know understanding those reasons why and how you can leverage that, the insight that you gain from that to help um, reactivate. Um, a, a really good book that it must be about ten years old by now um, by Jay Bear. It's called Utility. Um, it talks around if you can't 
sell to someone right now, um, you've got to be helpful to them. So even though someone might not be ready right now to, to buy from you, as long as you're um, keeping in touch and keeping an arm's, uh, you know, an arm's length, but providing useful, going back to, to, to one of Lila's pillars, actually. So someone could have gone through um, or you know, partway through a, a journey before, before ending, um, being able to um, get, put content in front of them that helps them um, and helps them from their pains and their challenges and the issues that they're have, having now will certainly just keep you front of mind. Um, so it's a really good mantra that stayed with me. If you can't sell to someone right now, be helpful to them. Um, and certainly in the B2B world where we have very um, you know, defined audiences, ICPs, much smaller audiences than our B2C counterparts, it's really important that we protect um, and continue to nurture, but in a non-invasive way, because we don't have a million audiences or millions that we can go after. So yeah, can't sell, be helpful. That's, that's, that's my mantra that I use. Anybody else have any parting um, think, Go ahead. Yeah, I think, um, I think for me is you do have to understand, you know, why is it you've lost that customer? But a lost customer isn't a lost customer, if that makes sense. Like there's never a thing where a customer has completely gone away, um, you know, from you. So, you know, really that's an opportunity to win back that customer. So whether it's that they've lost funding or whether it's that they have, um, you know, looked at a competitor and are given a competitor a while, it's never completely lost. And so it's always worthwhile figuring out how you're going to keep in touch with that lapsed customer and how you're going to try and engage them back and win them back. And I think the most important thing associated with that is understanding the reason why they um, have, um, you know, have had their heads turned or decided that they don't have enough budget or, or whatever. And I think the crucial part of that is figuring out what your product does um, and how you can make it as part of the rhythm of that organization. So how can you be essential? Because ultimately, if your product or your solution is essential in terms of that business operation, they won't cut you from the budget because they'll know um, that actually the return on their investment is well worth it. The business needs you. So how can you you get your product to be just part of the rhythm of that business to ensure that um, you know your customers see uh, see business value in your in your solution? Um, and then, if you do have a lapsed customer, how do you win them back? Um, so those are my two pieces. Also interesting about that topic, it, it, it depends on, you have to figure out why people are, are leaving. So I'll give you an example. When somebody's selling to me something I'm very interested in, but they don't respect my stated timeline, you know, I might just dis disqualify them just because they're too much in my face. Like, you know, I mean, if I'm saying, hey, I need a week, I'm talking to my 4.6 uh, stakeholders and they call me tomorrow after I just told them that, that's not a relationship builder. But if they call me in 10 days, and I just had a rough meeting with one of those four people, you know, uh, the chances of actually winning the deal just go through the roof in, in my experience. Um, I know we're out of time. I don't know if you guys noticed, but that hour went by oof, in no time. Um, hopefully everybody feels the same way. I certainly appreciate you guys for joining me uh, and sharing your, your knowledge. Uh, is there any way, if people want to connect with you, um, ask any other questions, are you willing to share your your contact details, or what's the? Um, how do you feel about that? Is there a website people can reach you? Yeah, certainly. Um, a good place to reach me is webio.com, um, or you can find me on LinkedIn, Chris Ashley Mans. Sean. Yeah, same for me. Yeah, my LinkedIn is uh, Sean Pender, and if you want to email me with anything, it's Sean.Pender at logmein.com. I'll uh, yeah, continue that theme um, on LinkedIn. Obviously, visit um, integrate.com and I'm uh, chris.wixon at integrate.com. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch and pick up the conversation, be more than happy to reconnect. With my first name, I am super easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, so follow me on LinkedIn or otherwise, um, wait at web, uh, webinsights.com. Um, but I'm certainly identifiable on, on LinkedIn. With, there's not many people with my first name. <laughs> Fantastic. And if you are watching on LinkedIn, I do have them tag have everybody tagged in um, in the show notes. So um, that post is currently on the top of my 
profile, make sure you can click on over and connect with everyone there. Um, thanks to the panelists. Thanks for joining us. We're right on the top of the hour. That's my German heritage right there. We start on time, we end on time. Um, really appreciate webinsights.com for hosting and sponsoring today's event. Um, check them out, turn your web visitors into leads quicker, and you, of course, can get a free demo on webinsights.com as well. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for uh, sharing your insights today. Until next time.